I'm going to go ahead and move forward in the program and introduce Erica. Um, Erica has a very special place in my heart because she um, is also our fabulous, wonderful graduate assistant who works in the Office of uh, Admissions. And she's, you know, she's so good that we almost sometimes forget that she's a student. <laughs> um, um, but Erica is going to be delivering the um, keynote address this evening. Uh, Erica Carlson is currently pursuing a Master of Divinity with a focus on Buddhism and leadership here at Harvard Divinity School. She was born and raised in Ogden, Utah, and graduated summa cum laude from the University of San Francisco with a BA in politics. She was awarded the Dean's Medal for Excellence in the Arts and was a finalist for valedictorian of her university class. She has had held several public policy fellowships, including the Institute for International Public Policy and the Coro Fellows Program in Public Affairs. She is the author of Rape and War in the Democratic Republic of Congo, one of the most downloaded articles in Peace Review, a journal of social justice. Prior to arriving at Harvard, she worked with Rockwood Leadership Institute the nation's largest leadership training organization for social change leaders. She also served on the board of directors of the San Francisco LGBT Community Center. She is the co-founder of Ariba Latinas, the first and only mentorship organization specifically for Latina youth in Utah. While at Harvard, Erica serves as the president of the university-wide Harvard Latino Latina Student Alliance, and as co-chair for the Harvard Graduate School Leadership Institute. She's definitely a very busy woman. Uh, upon graduation, she hopes to pursue a career in leadership development and talent management. Her interests outside of school include spending time with family and friends, biking, and hanging out with cute animals. <laughs> Um, and again, the title of her, of her talk today is Saying Yes. And so I'm very interested in hearing from Erica, as I'm sure you all are as well. So I'll hand it over to Erica. Yeah. Hi, everyone. Good evening. Uh, I want to begin by saying thank you to Director Prudence Goss for her introduction and the admissions office and the ambassadors for all the hard work they put in to bring this event to you today. I'd also like to say thank you to Dean Maritza Hernandez for her vision eight years ago in starting this program. And lastly, I want to say thank you to all of you for taking a risk and saying yes and hopping on a flight at 5 a.m. this morning or taking a long train ride to be here with us today. Exploring what it means when we say yes, even when it feels scary or out of reach, is what I, what I would like to share with you tonight. But first, I want to acknowledge all the people who have played a role in getting you here tonight. Last night, I participated in a Dia de los Muertos celebration at the Harvard Graduate School of Education. We shared the names of all the people we loved who had crossed on to the other side, sang songs together, and ate pan de muertos. That experience of reflecting on the legacy of the special people who have left an imprint on my life is still on my heart tonight. None of us get to where we are by ourselves alone. There are countless people along the way who support us, inspire us, encourage us to keep going when we're ready to give up, and in all the little and big ways make these types of opportunities possible for us. To acknowledge all the people who have brought you here, I'd like to draw inspiration from one of my favorite non-traditional ministers, Fred Rogers, or as some of you might know him, Mr. Rogers of the PBS television show. Hopefully some of you still know him and he's not off the air yet. <clears throat> if you're discerning what you might be able to do with a Master of Divinity degree, look no further than Mr. Rogers for what you can do with a theological education and the ways in which you can impact the world. Once, when Mr. Rogers was accepting a Lifetime Emmy Achievement Award, he went up on stage and he acknowledged all the people who made a difference in his life. He said, all of us have special ones in our lives who have loved us into being. The people who helped you to become who you are, who have loved you and cared about you 
and wanted what was best for you in your life. All of us have family, whether our families of origin or our chosen family, friends, partners, teachers, and mentors who have loved us into being. I invite you to please take a moment with me to silently think and thank the people in your life who have loved you into being. Whether they're on your heart or you said their name in your head right now, they're here with you tonight. Thank you for taking the time to acknowledge the people who have shaped you and made a difference in your life. It's important that we remember the people who have loved us into being and supported us when we said yes to some of life's scariest moments, like going off to college, studying abroad, taking that job opportunity when we weren't sure if it was going to be a good fit, or even applying and getting accepted to the Diversity and Explorations program at Harvard Divinity School. I was chatting with a few of you earlier today, and I can't believe that three years ago, I was sitting in your exact seat. I had caught an overnight flight from San Francisco to Boston. I had a quick nap, which I'm so grateful that I had, and then all the activities began. I remember feeling scared and frankly, a little overwhelmed by it all. I also remember being so intimidated. I mean, I was at Harvard. Harvard, a place that I never thought I would be a place that felt so far away from my family and my community. And yet, three years later, here I am with the extraordinary opportunity to be here with you today and to share a bit about my journey and the moments where I decided to say yes and to encourage you to do the same, to say yes to pursuing a graduate theological education and to consider saying yes to a place like Harvard, even when it feels so scary. Many of you are here today because someone, or many someones, said yes to helping you grow and develop. My story is no different. I was born and raised in Ogden, Utah. Since my parents worked full time, it was mostly my grandparents who raised my brother and I. My grandparents, or as I'll call them, mis abuelitos, were undocumented Mexican migrant farm workers who came to the US in search of opportunity. Mi abuelito had a sixth grade education and mi abuelita cannot read or write in either Spanish or English. And while some might say that they are uneducated because they lacked a formal education, I would say that they are some of the wisest people I know. I would even say that they are wiser than many of the top faculty, business, and political leaders I've met here in my time at Harvard. I imagine many of you have grandparents, teachers, friends, and mentors who are wiser than many of the faculty who wander the halls of Ivy League universities. I mention this because it's easy to fall into the narrative that this is a place where all the smart people go and that people who are on the outside of these walls have nothing to offer, that they're not smart, and that they're not wise. However, not everyone here at Harvard has wisdom. Wisdom is something that lives in living rooms, on the factory assembly lines, in fields under a hot sun, or in the sheer desire to survive in the face of poverty, structural racism, and homophobia. Wisdom is what me, my abuelitos have, and what I imagine what many of you admire, also, uh, many of the people you admire most have. Wisdom is also knowing when to say yes and having the courage to do so. I want to share with you three moments in my life when I said yes to what life was asking of me and ultimately what I was asking of myself. The first time I truly said yes was when I decided that I was going to leave Utah for college in San Francisco. I didn't know how I was going to pay for it or where it would ultimately lead me, but I knew that in order for me to survive and to grow in the ways I needed to, I had to leave home. When I was 18 years old, I got on a plane with a huge army duffel bag a huge army duffel bag, my brother's in the military, so I got one of those big green packs, which by the way, you can fit so much into. And I hopped on a plane and I started a new life. While that initial transition of living away from home was really difficult for me, 
I learned from that experience that I can make my home wherever I am because I carry the people I love in my heart. And I know many of you have already faced a similar challenge, whether you pursued college at an institution that was far away from home or made the decision to study abroad and left the country for the first time in your life. And I hope you can also attest to the ways in which it has helped you to grow as people and ultimately as leaders. And yes, if you're wondering, well, I don't know if I consider myself a leader, by virtue of you being here, you are a leader in your community. The second time I said yes, even when I was afraid, was when I made the decision to be authentically who I was and to come out to my family. I had been out to my friends since I was 12 and dated several people throughout high school, but all of this was kept a secret from my family. It wasn't until I was halfway through my first year of college at the University of San Francisco that I made the decision to come out to my parents. Now, I come from kind of a conservative family in Utah, so I grew up shooting lots of guns, eating mostly hunted meat, <laughs> and, many of my members of, and many members of my family had served in the military, including my brother and my dad. My mom frequently made homophobic remarks, and after hearing these remarks while I was in the closet, I was terrified she would stop helping me pay for college and disown me. I'll never forget the day I called her while she was at work, and I told her I wanted to talk to her after she got off of work. She came to my grandmother's house, where I was staying during spring break. We sat down on the bed, and all that came out of my mouth was, Mom, I'm gay, and I have known for a very long time, and I want you to know who I really am, and not hide it from you anymore. She broke down in tears. I broke down in tears. We both cried a lot. It was hard for her to believe. Although, I have to say in my mind, I was a little surprised that she was in surprise, that she was surprised. I was like, mom, didn't you notice boys never called the house? Or that I always hung out with one girl and we got into very dramatic fights? <laughs> Even though she was in denial in that moment, she said to me, Erica, I love you, and you will always be my daughter, no matter what. For me, that was a moment that made coming out worth it. I was terrified to say yes to who I really was and to share that person openly with my mom. I am so grateful that she has learned how to love and support me through it all. Whereas before, she would make homophobic comments, now she says things like, Erica, I know that you are a member of the L-G-B-T community. <laughs> with the care that she puts in to make sure all of the letters are there. She even has a, as her profile picture for a long time on Facebook, a picture of a heart that said, this person supports marriage equality. What I don't think she realized was that on the side of the picture, on the side of the heart, it said, have a gay day. <laughs> <laughs> what I learned most from my mom and from this experience is that to say yes to what was authentically true for me and to never underestimate someone's capacity to grow and change. Now, on to the last time I said yes. Even when I didn't know how it would all end, as you, and as you might be imagining, this was a time I decided to apply to Harvard Divinity School. I had graduated from school two years earlier, was working, and I thought I wanted to pursue a career in public policy. You know, I think there's this thing that happens where if you're smart and passionate about social change, you kind of get tracked into thinking that public policy and law is the best place for you to go and to make the impact that you want to make. And no one tells you that there are other avenues to explore like business, education, or even something like divinity school. Once I came to terms that I did not want to go to public policy school, even though everything else in my undergraduate career had prepared me for it, I was open to something else. Then Divinity School came across my path, and at first I was like, what's Divinity School and who goes there? <laughs> I'm not religious. If anything, growing up as a queer, mixed Catholic woman in Utah was a traumatizing experience for me. Then I started noticing that all the incredible people in my life had gone to Divinity School, and I realized that there was a clear thread of spirituality that motivated all of my social change work. I saw that all of the truly great social change leaders that I admired 
all had a sense of spirituality that grounded their work in a larger vision of what was possible for humanity. So, on a leap of hope, on a leap of faith and hope, I applied to the DivX program to explore, to explore more about what Divinity School could mean for someone like me. What I found was that there were people there who looked like me at Harvard, who cared about my background and interests, and that like almost over 10 years ago, when I first hop on that, hopped on that flight headed for college in San Francisco, I could make my home again. Or like Chicana scholar Gloria Anzaldúa said, I am like a turtle. I carry my home on my back. So once my heart was really set on HDS, I was even more terrified about applying. You all might be in a similar place now, where you're beginning to have an idea of the role Divinity School could play in your lives, and you might be thinking about what does it mean to be at Harvard in particular. Like me, you might have all these preconceived notions about who goes to Harvard, and that it might be mostly straight white men from privileged backgrounds. Well, there's certainly some of that here, and I'm not going to deny that. But there are also people like me who identify as queer, Latina, from a working class family. There's also people who are undocumented, black, Asian, trans, from middle class families, from the East Coast, from the Midwest to the West Coast, from international countries to coming straight from Boston proper, from folks who are straight out of undergrad to people who are looking to make a career change after working for 20 years. The point is, don't count yourself out based on whatever your perception is of who goes to Harvard. Instead of saying, no, there aren't people like me there. Instead say yes to what you might bring to Harvard because the fact of the matter is, we need you here. I need you here. Many of the tuitions that we are a part of were explicitly established to keep certain people out and to perpetuate the power structures at that time. Now it's up to us to bring ourselves into these spaces and to transform them. Because if we don't do it, who will? Sometimes, I think we count ourselves out of opportunities or we hold ourselves back because we are living in a state of fear. Sometimes, we're afraid to put ourselves out there for things because we're afraid to fail. We're afraid that we won't get that fellowship, that job, that acceptance letter, and that's enough to keep us from taking any action at all. Fear has a kind of paralyzing quality to it. It keeps us from moving forward in the ways we need to. Now, I'm not saying that we can't be afraid. I'm afraid all the time. I'm a little afraid right now. I hope that you're not bored. <laughs> I think the point is, is that we can experience this fear. We can be afraid that we will fail. We can even ask what we can learn from fear when it's in front of us, but that ultimately the choice and that the decision is up to us. We get to decide when we say yes. The choice is ours. I think sometimes our fear is grounded in very real experiences of external and internalized oppression. As people of color and folks from marginalized backgrounds, we constantly receive messages that we're not good enough or smart enough to go after our dreams. This internalized oppression weighs down on us in all the little and big ways, from raising our hand in the classroom to taking a risk and applying to things that seem very out of reach. If we want to break out of this oppression, if we want to get free, then we have to be willing to take a risk on ourselves and to say yes to stretching and growing in new ways. We need to define for ourselves what is possible for our lives, rather than resting on some preconceived narrative that is all about cutting us short. Sister Audrey Lord reminds us that when I dare to be powerful, to use my strength in service of my vision, then it becomes less and less important whether I'm afraid. Each of you has a vision for how you would like to make and grow your life. It was that vision that first motivated you to apply to the Diversity and Explorations program at Harvard Divinity School. Our world needs a new definition of leaders. Leaders who are willing to lead and respond in new and creative ways. Leaders who transform from the intersection of public policy and religion, from business and social responsibility to academia and social justice. An education grounded in the values of service, community, and faith can help transform the world and ultimately give us an opportunity to be more faithful.
In my first semester at Harvard Divinity School, we take this class called Introduction to Ministry Studies. And one of the definitions and one of the topics we talked about was this concept of faith. A definition of faith that was offered up was that faith is having a sense that the world is broken and that the world is in need of healing. And yet, there is so much more that is possible. Faith is reaching towards the wholeness that is possible. Or, as Indian activist Arundhati Roy puts it, another world is not only possible, she is on her way. On a quiet day, I can hear her breathing. Faith is working towards that other world who is not only possible, but who is on her way. I came to Harvard interested in the intersection of social change and spirituality. Over these past two years, I have grown and stretched in so many ways. I found my spiritual home in Buddhism and spent a transformative summer completing my field education in Nicaragua. I now see that my purpose is to inspire a sense of joy, compassion, and connection in the people and in the structures in which I work. I feel called to working with diverse sets of folks from leaders across sectors, business, law, policy, education, health, and religion, helping each of these leaders to not only identify and lead from their place of purpose and to understand why they do what they do, but to identify partners with whom they can do that work. At Harvard, I've been involved in the Harvard Graduate School Leadership Institute, working each semester to train over 30 Harvard graduate students from across the university in authentic leadership development. Our student-led, student-run project models our curriculum off of the Young President's Organization, which brings together young executives who lead companies with revenues in excess of 15 million and gives them a space to authentically discuss their challenges and personal and professional leadership struggles. Well, you might be wondering, well, what do you have to learn from all these like executives who have all of this wealth and they're talking about their struggles? What I learned from this is that those folks suffer too and that I have a connection with them in that suffering. And while it might be different, but they too are also caught up in something that's larger than themselves. Through this opportunity, I've met heads of state, business leaders like the founder of Zico Coconut Water, and even spent a weekend with one of the Navy SEALs who was part of the raid on Osama bin Laden's compound. I mean, talk about folks who suffer. Each of these interactions have challenged me to grow and think in different ways. And while I haven't agreed with everything and everyone I've met, I have learned one of life's most important lessons here at Harvard. How do we navigate power structures and still maintain a sense of integrity? Someone asked me earlier today about what the hardest part of being here was, and I'll say it was adjusting my first semester. I struggled with wondering if I was smart enough to be here if I was just kind of an affirmative action throwaway. What it meant to be at this institution when my family members remained in poverty and, st and some still relying on government assistance. While Harvard is an extraordinary place because of the opportunities that are available here, it is also a difficult place to be someone from a marginalized background. I'm not gonna lie and say that it isn't. But what I have learned from this experience is how to build community across interests and across identities, and how to both be part of a system and to work actively towards changing it. I can't change the system and the structures if I count myself out, if I count myself out and count others out at the get-go. I'm reminded of my fellow Buddhist sister, Bell Hooks, who says, for me, forgiveness and compassion are always linked. How do we hold people accountable for wrongdoing and yet, at the same time, remain in touch with their humanity enough to believe in their capacity to be transformed. Yes, graduate school is a challenging place to be on all levels, but I remain committed to the possibility that people and institutions can change. After Harvard, I'm hoping to enter into a career in leadership development or higher ed administration. I'm passionate about developing leaders from all backgrounds and especially encouraging those of us who have been told, either explicitly or implicitly, that we are not good enough and that we should count ourselves out. I want to say to them, myself included, that yes, we in fact say yes to some of our biggest dreams. So if I can leave you with anything to remember from tonight, 
it is that sometimes the most revolutionary things that we can do with our lives is to answer the calls that frighten us, to take the steps that seem so far out of reach, and to know that as Anais Nin puts it, life shrinks or expands in proportion to our courage. So say yes to you, to your dreams, whether they are moving you towards Harvard or another graduate school, to move towards hearing and working in faith for that other world that is not only possible, but is on her way. Thank you.